I was a little thrown off yesterday. I actually thought we were having Sunday school, so I was totally prepared for it. And then the last minute, uh, Mr. Shetler wanted the teens in there. So that, that was fine. I'll be uber prepared for next week. But I'm actually kind of glad the Lord works things out in, uh, in cool ways. Because as I was uh, told that I would need to prepare for this Monday, the, the lesson that, I, that the Holy Spirit kind of put on my heart was like... Uh, I kind of wanted to wait on the Sunday school lesson because it should come after it because of the things that we're going to talk about, and naturally enough, that did happen, so that's good. Um, it's a little dark, right? <laughs> First night teaching the youth group. Who will separate me from this body of death? Let's go with to Romans 7, verses 24 through 25 is going to be our focus but we're actually going to start in verse 12. We're going to read. We're going to stay right here too, uh, so we won't be turning anywhere else. But I'm going to start in verse 12. <clears throat> Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was that then which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become, might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. That do I not, excuse me. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I knoweth that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Here we go. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. It's a super important passage, and I'll be honest with you, when I read especially like 14 through 20, Paul always has that kind of like word salad there, that it's like, for that what I would do, not that I would do. And it's like, you got to really, really read that slowly, and I would encourage you over the rest of this week to go back and meditate on that. And we're going to get into a little bit of that tonight, but I, like I said, our focus is going to be on 24 and 25. So I'm, I'm going to ask you guys some questions. You know I like to, to ask questions. I think it's a great method for learning. Um, based upon what we just read, what is the body of death? And there are no wrong answers. I don't want you guys to be scared to talk out. I just, just, what is the body of death? Well, what do you think of? Based upon what we just read, um, physical body. Physical body, okay. Sin, okay. David, the flesh. Flesh, okay. Good answers. Good answers. Drew, you're right. It's sin. I did a little bit of research here, and I think it's really interesting. So we all know the Romans were like horrific when it comes to like governmental punishment of criminals, right? Um, we know the crucifixion was horrible. They actually had different kinds of punishments for different things. And so when Rome, because we know Pilate didn't hate Jesus, he actually didn't want to see Jesus killed, right? But God willed it, so it happened. For the enemies of Rome, though, like enemies of the state, there was a special punishment. And I just want to add this as a little aside because I thought it was super weird. And the 
more I thought about it, it was super horrible. For some criminals, they would put them, they would sew them up in a sack with a monkey, a dog, a snake, and a rooster, and throw them in a river. And not let them drown. So you can imagine the animals panicking in the water, what they would do to this person's body. This was just a form of torture. It wasn't the full punishment. So knowing that, <clears throat> when Paul's talking about the body of this dead or the body of death, there was a Roman punishment called the body of death. And essentially what it was is that for the most hated criminals in Rome, for the people that were enemies of the state, for the last remaining weeks of their life, and it would surely be the last remaining weeks of their life, they would take a corpse, freshly dead, and strap it to the back of the criminal, and they would have to carry around a corpse for however long they lived after that. And the hope was is that, well, what happens? You decompose, right? So the maggots, the rot, the disease, the bacteria would infiltrate the living flesh, take it over, and ultimately kill it very painfully and slowly, right? Super disgusting, I know. Oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Scholars, they, they did, they, there's two areas of thought. They don't disagree that this is a good picture image of what Paul's talking. Some scholars actually believe when he's talking about the body of death, sin, the flesh, that he is using this language because he is pointing to that punishment because the church would have known what he was talking about. Other people say he's simply referring to sin. It could be either or, but like I said, it's such a great picture image, and by great I mean horrific, but you understand. It's, it's, it's in your head. You won't forget it, right? body of death. There's another term that we're all familiar with. It's called dead weight. Anybody ever heard of dead weight? What is, what is dead weight? You can just shout it out. What does dead weight mean? Dead body. Something dead body? Meaningless? Meaningless? Boom. Were you up here sneaking around in my notes like Drew was? Okay. <laughs> So dead weight is a term that has come down through the generations to mean something that has no benefit or purpose, and it can actually cause harm, right? And to the Romans, the term dead weight referred to the practice of strapping a dead body or a corpse on a living criminal. But I want to I give you another picture image in your mind, if you will. <clears throat> term dead weight. And we're, we're going somewhere with this. Just follow me. So, anybody have a guess what this is? Mount Everest. Mount Everest. That's right. Look at you guys. How tall is Mount Everest? Does anybody know? Uh, 29,000. 29,000. 29, 000. 000. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, good thing I brought some other numbers. What's the deepest place in the ocean? 7.3 miles. Mariana's Trench, but there's a no place word. in Mariana's Trench that's... Oh, I don't know. Challenger Deep. Challenger Deep. That's right. Anybody know how deep Challenger Deep is? 20,000 feet. <coughs> no, for sure. 36,000 feet. It's seven. How high does the average uh, commercial airliner fly at cruising altitude? 30, 30, 30 something. Between 33 and 42,000 feet. So, Mount Everest, that, that's just to kind of give you guys some references. Let me, let me put it to you another way. If you're sitting on the beach in Florida, you're at perfect sea level, right? Mount Everest is 5.5 miles high. People fly to Mount Everest and spend obscene amounts of money to get there. It takes like $65,000 to $100,000. It takes six months of your time. And you have all these different base camps. And it's all because of oxygen deprivation. Your body doesn't perform the same 
at 19,500 feet as it does at 24,500 feet. So they spend months starting at base camp, climbing up through the ice fall, and, and starting the slow rotation of acclimating their bodies so they can eventually make it to the summit, 29,000, 29 feet. And so you get to base camp four right around 26,000 feet. Does anybody know what happens between 26,000 feet and 29,000 feet? It's up there. It's called the death zone. Anybody know why it'd be called the death zone? The air is thin. You can't breathe, right? People have to carry oxygen tanks with them. And you have to have just the right amount of oxygen. And it's actually really tricky. Think 2019 was either the single most or second most deadliest year on Everest. 11 people died. Only 381 people are allowed to climb every year. That's how many permits the, uh, that Nepal gives out from, from this approved tree. But when you get from base camp four and you move to the summit, you're in the death zone. And you have a day. You have a day to make it up and a day to make it back down before you run out of oxygen. And all kinds of things have happened. People have died on the summit coming back down because weather has come in and kept them there. They couldn't find their way down. They fell off the mountain. Does anybody know that there are still bodies up there on top of the Everest? Okay. That's the point I want to make here. When you're in the death zone and you come back down and you're tired and you're running low on oxygen, you can't stop. And there's a rule that mountaineers have. We're talking about dead weight. There's a rule among mountaineers in the death zone. It's a little blurry. It's kind of hard to see. It's probably a good thing. But um, you can't help somebody else when they're in trouble in the death zone. You know why? Because you're, you're dead too. That's a rule on Everest. And so what you have is people like the sitting man. The sitting man has a real name. But he summited and he came back down. And he got tired. And he sat down and he was resting. And people who knew better were like, man, you need to get up. You need to get up. You need to come on with us. He's like, ah, I'm good. I'm just resting for a minute. And he fell asleep. And there he stays. In the death zone. Deadly. So let me ask you another question. How does Paul come to carry this body of death? O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? He knows he has it. How does he come to carry it? This is kind of a tricky question. So he comes to carry it through God's law. But the law is a good thing, right? It's a good thing. So then how does the sinful body of death come from something good? It's because God's law is only a mirror. It shows us the hideousness and the decay of our sin upon us. And once you see your sin, there's no one seeing it. You must carry your own body of death. The law is just a mirror. It doesn't have the power to remedy the weight of our sin. Paul even says, uh, let's see. I can't find it. But he, he, he describes himself in one of the previous verses as sold under sin. And so Paul is saying that he is in bondage under sin, and the law of God is ineffective to help him. He's, let me put it to you this way, he's like a criminal. Huh? 14. 14, thank you. He's like a criminal who knows he's guilty. And the law can only help you if you're what? Innocent. He knows he's guilty, and the law can only help him if he's innocent. 
And we go back to Romans 3.23. And what does that tell us? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So why does Paul, who is clearly saved at this point, right? We know he's had his Damascus Road conversion. We know that the Holy Spirit has ministered to him and taught him how to be who he is in Christ. So why does Paul, as a believer, despair over his body of death? There's something peculiar. Yeah. He knows, he knows it will slow him down. Yeah, absolutely. There's something peculiar about, like, really solid Christians, right? You see, like, you don't want to idolize people, but it's okay to look up to people in the faith, right? And you look at people who are really mature in their faith and really strong. What's one thing you always notice about? And this pertains to everything we're talking about. It might not be super obvious. But there's always something really off, peculiar about them. Yeah. I was just going to say they're really sensitive about their sin. Yeah. They're really sensitive about their sin. They don't think they're great people, right? They think they're the worst of the worst. And what does Paul say? Don't talk to somebody else about their sin until you're convinced you're the chief of the sinners, right? He claimed he was the chief of the sinners. True Christians hate their sin and desire to be free from it. Growing in Christ makes you hate your sin and desire to be, and your desire to be free from it even greater. So, who will deliver Paul from this body of death? Romans seven twenty four. Paul's desperation and perspective is reached right here. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? O wretched man that I am. The ancient Greek word for wretched is literally uh, working to the point of exhaustion. Paul is completely worn out in his own strength because he is unsuccessful to come up under the principle of the law. And so this is important for us because one thing I want to get to, I want to make sure we don't go over too much. <clears throat> but one thing you see happen in Christian circles or people who grow up in Christian homes and eventually walk away from the faith because they never really had it to begin with. They always say Christianity is just a bunch of rules that I have to follow. And Paul is clearly saying here, I'm unable to follow the rules. There is no way I can do it. I want to go to verse 25. Because before this point, in this kind of monologue, if you will. Uh, Paul has mentioned himself 40 times. And he pivots right here in verse 25. He realizes that his pit of his unsuccessful struggle against sin, and in the pit of his unsuccessful struggle against sin, he's become self-obsessed. And this is the place of any believer who lives under the law. And so he asks, who will deliver me? Who will deliver me from this body of death? He looks outside of himself to Jesus Christ. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So finally, Paul looks outside of himself to Jesus, and as soon as he does, he has something to thank God for. So then in the mind, I serve myself with the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul